Sangyendro <coughs> 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 We must all strive to accomplish complete enlightenment for the sake of liberating infinite kind mother sentient beings. It's for that reason we should cultivate the altruistic motivation or bodhicitta motivation and with that kind of motivation we should all participate in this teaching. Whether we have been in Dharma or spirituality for a long time, or we are very new to Dharma, I think it's very important for all of us to often contemplate why we are engaging in spirituality. In other words, what is the purpose of our cultivating our spirituality? If we don't see the importance of uh, spirituality or dharma uh, in our life, and we don't have, uh, you know, good reasons uh, to establish why we need uh, spirituality in our life, then I think it would uh, it would uh, not be easy uh, for us uh, to engage in uh, spirituality. Uh, let me say this, that the universe or external environment that uh, we all sentient beings live in, as well as uh, we as sentient beings, the inhabitants of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the universe, uh, all of us are outcomes of uh, both collective and uh, you know, individual uh, karmic actions uh, that we have uh, accumulated. In other words, uh, what I'm trying to uh, get across to you is this, that um, when we talk of uh, karma, karmic action, uh, we can talk about uh, 
you know, two types of uh, comic action. Of course, we can classify karma into many different ways. One of the ways, uh, you know, from a broader perspective, to classify karma is into two types. That there is what we call to, in Tibetan chi karma, collective karma, collective karmic action. And then there is what we call uh, individual karma or sort of a personal karma. Uh, when we use the term karma, of course, uh, it is a Sanskrit term, and in Tibetan uh, we translate it as le, and in English uh, literally it means action. So we are basically talking about you know, actions that we uh, accumulate either collectively and or uh, individually. So one must not be caught up with uh, just the use of the language. It's like a karma. So when you hear the term karma, you know, don't think like, well, that must be something, you know, Buddhist belief in or has something to do with, you know, this, you know, Buddhism has nothing to do with me. No, we are basically talking about ourselves, actions that we undertake. No, no. If we you know, take a moment to think about all types of experiences that we, uh, you know, as people, or for that matter as sentient beings, uh, go through living within the, this human society. We are all part of this world. But then within this world, we have, uh, you know, many different countries. And each country may have its own unique uh, you know, environmental uh, characteristics, for example, or unique cultures and unique uh, way of thinking. And as we know that all of us do not ex necessarily experience the same kind of, uh, how should I say, uh, the, 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 the same kind of experiences. So we differ in many ways uh, from each other in terms of uh, where we live, uh, and in what kind of society we live and what kind of experiences we go through. And in some parts of the world, uh, the environments are extremely beautiful. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the you know, people who live in those uh, areas uh, and also the animals, you know, they uh, live very peacefully without hurting uh, one another. Uh, Whereas in other parts of the world, uh, you know, the environment itself is, uh, you know, very challenging, uh, very difficult. It is, uh, uh, you know, very rugged kind of environment and uh, in many ways, you know, sort of uh, almost uh, inhospitable. And then people who live there, and uh, animals who live there as well, you know, they do not have peace. You know, it's as if, you know, they all constantly live under fear and threat. Maybe the wars are going on, or there are all kinds of uh, conflicts, you know, going on. And so we do see these differences in uh, within our own uh, world system. So that the so, 
So at a societal level, you know, we do find uh, such differences, uh, you know, among ourselves. There are certain societies, you know, they have very beautiful land, beautiful, you know, environment, and people who live in those, uh, uh, you know, uh, lands, uh, relatively speaking, they have peace. And, uh, okay, now I do know that, they, you know, there is a child there, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is, um, uh, you know, peace and, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, do not seem to hurt each other. But in other kind of society, at a societal level, you see, the whole environment is fraught with conflicts and, you know, wars and, you know, people have no peace. They constantly live under threat and danger. And so we see those things at a societal level. So which is basically due to, in some sense, collective karmas that uh, people in different uh, areas have uh, accumulated. But then within each of these, uh, uh, you know, situations which I just, uh, you know, mentioned, we do find individuals who do not seem to be affected at their level by whatever is happening uh, at a larger societal level. In other words, in areas where so much danger, so much risk, but there are individuals, it seems like their life is still relatively peaceful, you know, they are not threatened, you know. Or in some good areas where everybody is, seems to be having a good time, but certain individuals, you know, all, it's like, you know, all the miseries have fallen on them. So, I mean, th th those things are, again, due to one's individual or what we call personal karma. So this is how... Uh, at a very, uh, how should you say, uh, gross level, I could say that how the collective karma and individual karma uh, play out. So, say, le mantra wa sape, and jebu ta nami te ya, nami se namdu jindu jindu jebu te ya ta, ane mantra ki yu yate, ngeba dung rato tongu yu arite, so, son chan ta, le sheba pa kiki, du se ne te se kwebe to, kweba ko wal drogo yu yana, ane, te ne mantra wa yun tu ma reos. Then they may have a sense of the penna. Ah, they do the Zangi Kandiki in a social toller, young, young, but in a Zahako, the Cheta, social around social, lay Santi, Nami, the Ransole, social, young, you have a day, never do, have a shepherd. I mean, based on our own, uh, how should we say, I mean, experiences, we do see those differences, and we must understand that. All those experiences people go through, both good and bad, a lot of this has to do with, um, not a lot of them, I should they have to do it with uh, their collective and individual, uh, you know, karmas or karmic actions. Because as we often talk about, karma has many different aspects or dimensions. So, you know, we experience results according to the type of karma that we create and accumulate. So that's what we call the results corresponding to their causes, you know, to use uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the technical language. And so what these things tell us is that there isn't uh, somebody out there or something that is what we call a creator. You know, as if there's one creator and creating all this stuff, is that, that can be. You know, if everything has been created by the creator, meaning only one creator, then all things should be equal, right? Uh, but whereas things are not. So people are in different environments, go through different experiences. So this tells us that all these things have to do with, you know, we as peoples are collective and individual karmas. It has, no, it has nothing to do with somebody out there, you know, uh, creating all of us and then making us go through all the stuff. If somebody is there or whatever that, you know, person is or that thing is or that object is or that principle is, whatever you want to call it, the creator, then these differences couldn't exist. We should all be same. Well, at a very basic uh, level, uh, we are all same in that. What do we really want? You know, we want 
peace, happiness, and goodness. What we really don't want, all of us don't want any kind of uh, pain, suffering, problem, difficulties. So we are all same, you know, in those respects. So as we recognize that all of us have the same wishes, if you will, we wish for peace, happiness, prosperity, goodness, success. We do not wish for any kind of problem, difficulties, pain, suffering. Then we must understand that you know, uh, we need to uh, engage in actions accordingly. You see, because uh, the things we experience, uh, good and bad, happiness and suffering, peace and, you know, war, all the, of these are outcomes of, uh, you know, certain causes. Uh, so if we don't want any kind of misery or suffering or pain, then what we really need to do is we need to purify ourselves of negative or bad karmas that we have accumulated from the past. And then we must also resolve not to create any new negative karmas, and it is through these processes that we are able to put an end to suffering that we don't want. So that wrong devil the chivo in a jute yang te and tai kiba chava that can ye wrong chu dugur chu duba in a wrong chu shava che chu ten ye chu yamsalans in a duba till in yamsalans in a sonza to shave in a tin you got to go big what they never say get the palm ever zoya town. Only on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, all of us are seeking happiness, goodness, peace, and for that we need to accumulate uh, positive uh, karmic actions or good karmas. So basically what I'm talking about here is, you know, why we need dharma or spirituality in our life. Of course, first we need to educate ourselves in dharma, spirituality, and once we have gained the knowledge, understanding of dharma, that is even more important for us to implement dharma, to put it into practice, to cultivate it. So by pursuing dharma through study and practice, that we are able to uh, purify ourselves of all the negativities and defilements which otherwise could bring us suffering, and we are able to accumulate positive actions and also cultivate wisdom which will bring us uh, happiness and uh, peace and uh, uh, all types of goodness. So, that's why in the world, we are going to be in the world, we are going to be in the world, we are going to be in the world, we are Yella nebe ritu tan majebeshe. Rang luta mata yusumke. Yella nea gritan majebeshe. Tati never do a pangu. So if Dharma is so important in our life, then of course, you know, we can uh, ask, you know, how can I practice Dharma? What does it mean to practice Dharma, to cultivate Dharma? Well, of course, we can talk about uh, practicing Dharma at a very simple level or at a very vast and profound level. Uh, but at a very basic level, what we are talking about here is to practice Dharma means at the minimum, if you will, we must not harm anybody. We must not hurt anyone. 
What do we mean? We must not you see, use our body, speech, and mind, our actions of body, speech, and mind to bring harm to other sentient beings. So that is a part of uh, our Dharma practice. Of course, uh, I mean, the, the, the best thing would be, you know, if we could uh, benefit others or bring benefits to others through our actions of body, speech, and mind. Why? Right? Basically, means we, you know, uh, use our body to benefit others. Uh, well, you know, in other words, we engage in actions physically, verbally, and mentally, which bring benefits to others. So that's what we should strive to do. But if we couldn't benefit others, help others, at least in the minimum, we must not hurt others physically, verbally, and mentally. Well, that's what we do. So she sang with all the song of tongue. That's so when we talk about uh, you know spirituality or dharma, it has a lot to do with uh, thinking inside us, and involves a lot of thinking and contemplation. Of course, uh, you know the best is if we can dedicate our life completely into uh, you know dharma practice, study and practice of dharma, which basically means we completely abandon uh, worldly activities and worldly concerns. But that would be really, I think, uh, very hard for most of us because we need to go to work, we need to function in this world, so to speak. So as we go to work, we should see that, you know, our actions of body, spirit, and mind do not harm anybody. Uh, as we go to work, we try to see that we could help or, you know, benefit others, you know, through our actions of body, speech, and mind. So that's how we can uh, uh, conduct our life, everyday life, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, dharma or spirituality. As I often remind ourselves that of our actions of body, speech, and mind, of all of the three things that each of us has got, body, speech, and mind, mind is the most important uh, thing. And uh, so what does it mean to engage in dharma or spirituality in everyday life is that, you know, whatever we are doing, we need to go to work, we need to go to school, we need to do all the things, but see that our mind, you know, it stays in a positive state. We are able to direct our mind into positive thinking, positive actions, and we refrain our mind from negative thoughts, negative thinking, and negative actions. So that is how we cultivate Dharma in our everyday life. Uh, uh, so 
as I mentioned earlier, that all of us need to purify our mind of uh, all the negativities that we have accumulated uh, from a very long time. And uh, so we have accumulated uh, innumerable negative karmic actions in relation to sentient beings, for instance. Of course, there are many methods in Buddhism which we could uh, uh, cultivate or use to uh, get rid of negativities from our mind. Uh, perhaps the two most powerful methods are cultivating love and cultivating compassion, you know, for sentient beings. Now, when, we, when I say cultivating love and compassion here, in this context, we are talking about cultivating great love, Mahamaitri, and great compassion, Mahakaruna. And by definition, great love and great compassion mean that we should extend equal love and compassion to all sentient beings without, you see, any kind of discrimination. And so by cultivating great love and great compassion, we're able to counteract, you know, innumerable negativities that we have accumulated in relation to sentient beings. So we're able to purify, you know, uh, you know innumerable negative karmas that we have accumulated uh, in relation to sentient beings. Compassion mm. is the same thing that we have to do with the people who are in the world. We have to do with the people who are Sinji dunga wala mini. Sinji dunga wala mini. Tinzu tanji eni. Dungi teli taba shu sambita. Dimba shu trangwa jishay gu yor. I believe that, um, you know, many people use uh, the word or the term compassion. And we might, uh, you know, act as if we understand what it means. But what do we mean by great compassion or Mahakaruna in Tibetan Nyingji Shembo here? Is this that we uh, focus our mind on sentient beings who are going through suffering and we sincerely wish from the bottom of our heart uh, to see them free from, being freed of suffering. In other words, uh, we wish sentient beings to be free from uh, their suffering, uh, and that uh, that state of mind, that feeling is called uh, great compassion. Uh When we talk about cultivating great compassion, great compassion is focused on all sentient beings. Literally, all is underlined, A-L-L, all. And uh, so that means there is not a single sentient being that can be excluded from the focus of great compassion. Because you know, often we you know, maybe hear somebody say that, you know what, yeah, I know it's really important to cultivate you know, compassion, great compassion, but I cannot do that with you know, X, Y, and Z. So and so I can do that. So and so I just can't. Other than that, I could. Well, the thing is that if we exclude a one sentient being from the focus of great compassion, the great compassion is not great compassion. It is an incomplete great compassion. So that doesn't work. And so it's really, I mean, there's a tremendous challenge uh, we go through in training our mind because we need to regard all sentient beings as being equal, whether they are our friends, dear and near ones, or whether they are strangers, we don't know who the heck they are. Keshila didn't say who the heck they are, but you get the message. And, and whether they are our number one enemies, you know, who just bring us so much trouble as if that's the best job they can do. Uh, I guess I didn't say that too, but just to make the point. Our enemies. So 
So we need to see, regard all sentient beings as being equal and sincerely wish each of them to be free from their suffering. So that state of mind is so precious, that's what we call great compassion. So there is nobody to be excluded. And great love, Mahamaitri or Chamba Chambo in Tibetan, is a state of mind, or is a feeling, truly wishing all sentient beings, all underlined sentient beings, to be endowed with happiness and its causes. When we truly wish every sentient being, nobody to be excluded, nobody to be discriminated against, every sentient being to be happy, to have the causes of happiness, that state of mind is very precious, it's called great love. So this is, uh, you know, you know, will serve, I think, what I've just uh, talked about, uh, uh, you know, is intended to serve as a reminder for many of us who already know about these things. And, of course, uh, this is maybe, uh, you know, a new lesson for people who are new uh, to this uh, kind of uh, uh, teaching. So all of us, whether we are new to Buddhism or old to Buddhism, we need to contemplate and consider these issues. No, no. Now let me go back to where we left off uh, in the, the Kadamba Geshe's wonderful teaching called Miscellaneous Collection of uh, Great Kadamba Geshe's uh, Advices. So remember, we uh, are witnessing a uh, question and answer session, if you will, uh, between the great Indian master Atisha and uh, three of his greatest disciples, uh, Domtemba, and Ngokten, and Kuten. So Domtemba, Ngokten, and Kuten. In Tibetan, we just combine their name as, you know, Kungok uh, Domsum. Uh, so they are posing questions to great Atisha, their mentor or the spiritual guru, and Atisha is answering their questions. Oh, yeah. That's because the natural of the and remember they asked Atisha, what is the best path, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, complete enlightenment? Yes. Well, it seems like they asked only one simple question, like what is the best path? But of course, you know, they, you know, uh, that, that question has many uh, sides or dimensions to it. Almost they're asking what is uh, uh, the best kind of practitioner, what is the best, you know, path, and so on. And uh, so as we uh, witnessed, Atisha, you know, gave a long answer, uh, you know, uh, to their question. So Adisha told them that first, the best, uh, what are called um, uh, expert, if you will, is uh, one who uh, realizes uh, uh, selflessness. So the one who realizes selflessness is the best expert. Keba. Yes. No. 
and maybe in today's language we can say the best scholar. And of course, you know, we can, you know, scholars can be of different kind, right? I mean, everybody, somebody could be called scholar, or many, but they may not be on the same level. Uh, from Buddhist perspective, um, uh, one who is considered the best scholar, if you will, or the greatest scholar, or as I use the best uh, uh, expert, is someone who has expertise in what is known as uh, five uh, sciences, five sciences. Uh, five domains of knowledge, literally translating. That the man does in the only thing more than more than my shivina, and it's a bottle of dark bus. Dark man, dark, that dark repeal, repeal, repeal. So, what are the five sciences, the five domains of knowledge from Buddhist perspective? The first is called Taripa. You know, one uh, who uh, has expertise in the, what we call the, uh, the uh, grammars of language. Mm. Derek was here to any pen at the Crescenta. Dark Cranky, Tony, and it took Kojima with that pen, so he and Latu Kind of the New York was Sanjay Sung. But then Tenema Mobile Gogores. Although, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the different languages uh, are part of this uh, category called Tarikpa. So that's why often we translate it as, uh, you know, grammars of languages. But Geshe is trying to explain that it's not just only confined to grammars of language. It's not just a linguistic uh, grammars, but it also deals with uh, the sound system of the language. For example, in Buddhism, we talk about how an enlightened uh, speech has 60 melodies. So all of those melodies and their qualities and how, you know, well, Uh, you know, th those are formed, and all of those sound systems are part of uh, this domain of knowledge called Tarikpa. That is not the Sawarikpa. Make a quarter of the then make a quarter make a quarter of the Sawarikpa. And the second uh, science or the domain of knowledge is called Sawarikpa, uh, the science of healing, or in other words, uh, science of medicine. That is Zorikpa. And then the third domain of knowledge, or we call the science, Rigpa, knowledge, domain of knowledge is uh, Sorigpa, meaning uh, arts and crafts. And another domain of knowledge or science is called Tensic Ripa, science of uh, reasoning. This is where you know, we lo learn about uh, all kinds of uh, logic and ration rationality. So in Buddhism, you know, there, there's a very extensive, this is a very extensive area where we can talk about different types of logic and reasoning. Uh, Uh, for example, in Buddhism, we use uh, certain logic and reasoning uh, to establish uh, uh, the existence of a phenomenon at a great distance that we do not see from this end. And so there are many great logics being used, and uh, I mean, things which are, I should say, beyond our sensory perceptions in some sense. And uh, I mean, one of the basic things, for example, is, uh, you know, at a great distance behind that hill, you know, we can say there is uh, fire because we see smoke 
you know, rising up from behind that uh, uh, hill. So by using smoke as a reasoning, we can establish the existence of fire, you know, behind that hill, which we don't see from this end. Well, perhaps it's not much, you know, being sense like, okay, if we can establish the existence of fire behind the hill, well, you could say, who cares? So what? You know, what, what the woman, what's the big thing about that? Well, that is just a kind of an example we use, but the more important thing is, based upon, you know, all the, the, the suffering that we experience now, we can establish how we had accumulated negative karmas in the past, in the past lives. So it is through reasoning that we establish uh, what we did in past lives. And based on the positive experiences of this lifetime, you know, whatever happiness and whatever comforts and good, good things happening in our life, we can establish what we did in our previous lives, the good karma that we did and accumulate in previous lifetimes. So basically, we need to reason all things out. Is there are all kinds of reasoning, uh, valid reasons that we use to establish uh, an existence of uh, a phenomena uh, which we do not have direct access to uh, uh, in a, uh, now. Yes. And to give another example of a Buddhist logic is that if anything is produced, then that thing must be an impermanent phenomenon. So using product as a reasoning, we start to establish uh, an object or a phenomenon as impermanent. So if something is established as impermanent, then we must also understand that an impermanent phenomenon, it disintegrates. It does not, uh, I should say, uh, stay static and, uh, you know, uh, and exist forever. Well, then again, uh, I mean, Kishore didn't say it, but just to make his point, he said, okay, somebody may say, okay, so what's the big deal if you can establish a phenomenon or object that's impermanent through reasoning? Again, what, what is this big deal you're talking about? Well, the big deal is not so much that we can establish a phenomenon as impermanent, but now, you see, uh, use the same reasoning to understand our own life. So now if we can establish that our life is impermanent based upon authentic reasoning, then we got to understand that our life disintegrates, it is changing all the time, so we cannot grasp at the permanence of life. Just figure that one out. Life is impermanent. <laughs> And then the, uh, another domain of knowledge or science is called the science of mind. Now this is where we talk about all different types of mind and Buddhist paths. You know, all the structure of the paths leading to different uh, uh, states of realization. So now, of these five domains of knowledge, or five sciences, uh, of course, the most important one is the science of uh, mind. So, someone uh, who has the expertise in the science of mind, or the science of inner phenomena, literally translating Nang Rigpa in Tibetan, then that person is the real expert or the scholar. 
so now going back to what uh, great Atish has said, uh, the best expert or the greatest scholar, Kebe uh, Cho, the top of the line scholar, is someone who has realized selflessness. So why is this realizing selflessness uh, such a big deal, if you wonder? Well, why it's such a big deal is because that when we look uh, at the Four Noble Truths, while like Buddha's first sermon or the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, uh, there are two truths that we need to abandon, the truth of suffering and the truth of cause of suffering. So in order to get rid of those two truths that we do not want, we need to realize true path. In other words, we need to realize what selflessness is. So therefore, it is a big deal because through realizing selflessness, we can free ourselves from suffering and its causes. As great Indian master Acharya Chandrakirti states clearly in his uh, supplement to the middle way of Madhimik Avatar, it's a treatise. And as Geshe quoted the lines from his memory, and Chandrakirti said, you know, the reason why he taught, meaning Buddha taught, two selflessnesses, the selflessness of a person and the selflessness of phenomena is because he wants sentient beings to be liberated from suffering. So realizing the two types of selflessness or selflessnesses is the great liberator because it liberates you from suffering. Mm. Well, when we talk about how, you know, everything that exists is devoid of uh, self, we must not equate selflessness as meaning complete non-existence. Because selflessness is not the same as things don't exist at all, because that is a denial, you see. So we do not want to fall into a nihilistic view, extreme nihilism. By saying that self phenomena are selfless, we are not saying that phenomena do not exist at all. Everything that exists it must exist conventionally, but that it must not exist ultimately. That's what we're talking about. In terms of ultimate truth, phenomena do not exist, but conventionally they do exist. Well, these are not easy to understand, but nonetheless, we have to deal with these issues. But as we, you know, familiarize ourselves with uh, these uh, matters, then as time goes by, it becomes easier for us to understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the true truth, conventional truth and ultimate truth. So therefore, uh, those who have realized the selflessnesses, they are 
the best expert or the greatest scholar. Maranzo Tanda Hindu Yamas, in a oh, that is such a much of a human dadua, and such a much of a human rather than it, and it dummy between the Torres and Arti Totuma, Tumna, as some do it, tell me what's shabby in a day, and call any pay, let's say, Kimbushi girls, Kori, Kota, Kori, Jill, let's say, Kimbushi girls. We have not yet realized selflessness, uh, but if we do kind of a wonder what selflessness is, and if uh, we, uh, how should I say, uh, direct our mind to understand what selflessness is in a, in a, in a, in a positive direction, that's what I meant, then that kind of state of mind itself, although we don't realize selflessness yet, but because of our mind tended towards what selflessness is, that state of mind of is so powerful to shake the world of samsara. So that is my commentary on the, uh, what Adisha said first. What does it mean to be the best scholar? And then the second one, now I believe that you uh, already uh, took notes of this. Uh, Adisha said, uh, the one who is most subdued or most disciplined, I might have used that word, in Tibetan, is the one who has disciplined his or her mind, one who has subdued his or her mind. Uh, now, what does it mean to subdue one's mind or to discipline one's mind? What it means is like, you know, the subdue has a sense of making our mind peaceful, right? Because our mind is very much disrupted and disturbed by negative emotions or delusions such as anger, attachment, uh, hatred, ignorance, uh, any other form of delusion. You know. So when we subdue our mind, of course the best case would be someone who has completely abandoned delusions from within his or her mind. Now that is really the, 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 great, the, the great subdued mind. But even if the delusions are there in our mind, if we do not let delusions control our mind, if we do not let delusions dictate our mind, then, you see, we could still say that we are subduing our mind or our mind is being disciplined. So, the first thing that I was saying is that I was saying 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 as uh, one of the greatest uh, Kadamba Geshe's or the masters by the name of Geshe Bekunchen said, he said in a very metaphorical sense, he said, I always stand at the mouth of the cave of my delusions with a spear of antidote in my hand. In other words, Geshe Ben said that he always stand at the door of the delusions with a spear in his hand, spear of antidotes in his hand as a weapon. When they get tough and rough and wild, they meaning delusions, then, you know, he applies 
more aggressively his antidotes. In other words, he poked the delusions with his spear of antidotes. When they rest, then he rest. So, um, every uh, day we need to uh, look at our mind. We have to examine our mind. There is an interesting uh, uh, you know, book of advice in Tibetan, maybe you don't know about it. It's called the Kachapalu's Advice, and this has a pearl of wisdom from Kachapalu. And uh, so in the advice he said, when you are in a crowd, meaning with other people, you know, you should watch out your mouth. That means just, you know, watch out what you are saying, just watch your mouth. But when you are alone, he said, watch your mind. <laughs> <laughs> And I think he got the truth there. Uh, and then uh, he also said in a very uh, kind of a poetic way, which I can't capture in translation, uh, he said that if you are not careful with this rat thing in your mouth, if you wiggle your tongue too much, then you might get a you know, nice beating on your round head. You know. <laughs> So those of us who live in the you know, society, I think those are really good advices we need to pay attention to. I think those are helpful advices. Oh, oh yeah. That's Often, uh, you know, we may talk about, uh, you know, mindfulness in what we do and think and all that. And, you know, often some people, you know, they talk about, oh, I'm practicing mindfulness. And all the things they list are all the things, you know, they remember to do or not, you know, uh, stuff like that. Oh, I remember this. I remember doing that. What? But that, in some sense, is not a great thing. Yeah, I mean, it's just a laundry list of what you remember. Uh, but when we talk about real mindfulness practice, what we're really thinking about is being mindful of our state of mind. If our mind is following negative, you know, uh, path, then we should, you know, bring our mind back home, so to speak. But if our mind is following positive thinking, let it go. You know, let it do the positive thing. So, you know, mindfulness in this sense has a real meaning. Not because mindfulness meaning that I remember doing this, that, and, you know, those, and, you know, but that's, uh, you know, uh, not much of a, a thing, a meaning. Well, that's somebody. You did you and third thing, Atisha said that the best quality, I literally translating here, is uh, someone who is uh, very kind uh, to others. So kind in the sense of the kindness as a state of mind, especially someone who really has uh, or is cultivating great love and great compassion for others, so that person is truly kind and caring. Uh, 
Pimpe Samba Tambe in Auntie and Rang Dipper Savat Zubet Tile in the Kitchen with Chagaris. So being compassionate, being loving, uh, you know, through these positive attitudes of kindnesses that we are able to purify lots of our own negativities. The image you say, you could have asked, you say, Carlesena. Rang Dipper Sajani, Luta Nata Yig Dipper Sajani, Sinti Yenlet in Sayoris, Sinti Yenlet in Sayoris, Sonsata, and a Rang Sinti Yenlet, Shuri Mabe Pensin Javina, D in the Katir Changores. So, how is that, if you wonder? Now, when we when we do negative things and accumulate negative things, mostly, as I said, in relation to sentient beings, right? We think negatively about others, we say something negative to them, and we do something negative to them. So that's how we create and accumulate negativities. Now, if we think something positively, you know, we extend our love to them, compassion to them, of course, these positive states of minds counteract the negative states of mind that, that we had before. So that's how uh, cultivating, uh, uh, you know, positive states of minds uh, is, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, is very, uh, um, is considered as the best uh, quality uh, uh, one could have. No, no. That's the day, young is. And uh, we will stop there uh, so, I guess I would like to uh, uh, ask all of you to join in the prayers uh, for them. Nonas. Shadow Golu, Jabotom, Alleta Whatever merit that we have accumulated together this morning, we dedicate it for the flourishing of Dharma, the source of benefits and happiness throughout the universe. We dedicate our merit for the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other great holy masters. May they live long and be successful in fulfilling their visions, benefiting sentient beings. May spiritual communities throughout the world and spiritual practitioners from all traditions remain healthy, harmonious, and be successful in fulfilling their spiritual aspirations. May this and other world environments be free of all kinds of unwanted pains and problems, and beings find peace, happiness, prosperity, and spirituality. Yes. 
In short, we dedicate our collective uh, marriage, positive karma, for all kind mother sentient beings to be free from the fears and dangers of two types of mental obscuration, obscuration to personal liberation and obscuration to omniscience, and may we all reach complete enlightened state quickly. I have two announcements to make. Uh, announcement one, any would like to, uh, you know, any help you could give us right after the teaching uh, to uh, put stamps on our newsletters and mail them. So please, uh, you know, she need extra hands. So any volunteers to do that, we appreciate that. And the second announcement is, uh, uh, you know, Gisela has, uh, uh, you know, a student from Europe visiting him. Uh, because this year Gisela couldn't go to Europe, so his students are coming here. And uh, so uh, they would uh, like to invite Gisela for lunch. So I would uh, ask people to postpone your visit to Gisela. Except the one. <laughs> Keep going, see. Come up, okay. That's quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Three. Mark, this, this Sunday. Three, this kind of question. Three, this kind of question. 